Can everyone see this right now? It's good. Okay. All right. So, um, you can have different places where you identify the cl the climax. This is how I diagrammed it. Uh, you can have it if you look down here. I tried to look at each action. So if I'll just zoom down here, each action, there's a verse, there's a verse. So each one of these squares represents a different action, okay? And so actually looking back, the one thing I would change here, I'll, sh I'll email this to everyone, okay? There's, it's not perfect, you know, maybe you wanna change some things. But the one thing that I, I would change is that yeah, you, you just have, if someone has a lot of, there's a lot of statements, like there's a, it says Boaz said, and then there's a series of comments. I just consider that as one action. That's one statement describing the events, okay? So, that, so that's what I have here. All right, um, let's go back now to our discussion here. Okay, so... Um, so really anywhere I, I actually, so I have it here. Uh, four, five, six. So really all of these, all of these climaxes are acceptable. Okay. All right. So, um, any questions now before we get to the other parts? Any questions with how we got to that? Is is how we do this making sense to you so far? Any questions that you have? Let, let's let's take a moment. What are your questions for doing this procedure? Very interesting to me. Very interesting. I like it. I enjoy it. Okay, I, I think it's self-explanatory. I don't see any questions. I, I, I think it's self-explanatory. It makes sense. Um, okay, let's let's come back here now. Let's discuss. Let's discuss. Um, Christ and the gospel. Okay, so let's talk first. Actually, I'm sorry. Let's go back here. Uh, let's ask the second question here. What is the main plot? What's the main plot of the story now? From looking at, the, at all four chapters, looking at the story, what, what's the main plot of the story? Anyone? Nobody wants to answer, so I redemption plan. My my answer to the group was a preload to the coming Messiah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So this is the the main story is the uh, the lineage. Great. Now, Koya Boboy, where, where did you arrive at that conclusion? How did you arrive at that conclusion? G give, me, give, me some, give me some things in the text that would make you, make you come to that conclusion. Uh, if you look at the, at the end of the story, it gives us the, the future. Who will be the descendants of Boaz and Ruth? Uh, Boaz will have this child and then up to JC, up to David. Uh, it stopped on uh, David, although at that time David was not yet born, but we already knew in some of the chapters that uh, David would be the ascendant of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So here we are given the lineage as to where will it start because uh, the lineage is usually three generations. Uh, if we follow the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob lineage, it's usually three generations. So it's the same introduction 
up to David. So that's that's how I got the idea that this is, that we are just being given the preload or the the family background or the lineage where Jesus or the coming Messiah will come from. Good, good. Now that's good. That's good. So we we see that this is the resolution or the conclusion. We see that. We see this um, uh, emphasis upon the Messiah. This is, this is David. Someone else, what, where is another place in the passage of the story that really highlights, that highlights that this is the main story, that this is the, really the big, the big plot? I would, I, would, uh, I would argue on, on chapter 4, starting at verse 13, where uh, Boaz took Ruth as his wife. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think that's the main plot there. And, and it, the main plot usually uh, uh, connected to the whole story of the Bible. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah, the themes of marriage is there, and the importance of of redeeming the the, the descendants of 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 the king of Israel, which is without marrying Ruth, the promise that God has given to Abraham will not be uh, fulfilled in in Davidic kingship. So I think I think uh, uh, it, it culminates. Partially, I think it partially it uh, it fulfills the 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 promise of God from Abraham from Abraham, and yep, yeah, there. So or 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 at or at least uh, it's it's now the the bridge between the the promise of God to Abraham to fulfilled in 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 David, you know, in David. So I think I think it's uh four verse thirteen. No, that's good. That's good. Anyone else? No, I, I agree with Sonny. So, so it's not an either or. This is these are proofs. So this would be one. This would be two. I'm looking for other proofs. What's another proof that really keys us in to emphasize that that the focus is really upon is really upon um, this idea of offspring, the offspring of Abraham. Anyone else want to add? Oh, Ruth chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. So it's like salvation was open to Gentiles. Okay, now that's really good. That, now that's really good. So, uh, The word, I have found favor, my Lord, that's grace coming from Boaz. So this is going back to what, what, hang on here, I'm, I'm, give me one second because I'm supposed to be, <laughs> Hold on one second. I don't know why we're not screen sharing here. Give, give me one second here. I need to be screen sharing for, for the other students. Um, one second here. I'm not. Okay, sorry. So uh, what Henry's talking about here is this is referring to the Abrahamic covenant. Right? In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Correct? Everyone tracking with me there? So you see this, this, this Gentile that is being accepted by Boaz, right? Now, Henry, where is another place where you see this Gentile 
being converted. So Ruth 2.13 is a place. Where, where's another passage of scripture that really highlights this conversion, this commitment of Ruth to, um, to join in? Anyone, uh, anyone or, or, or Henry? When, uh, oh. Or anyone. Yes, Yes, uh, when uh, uh, no, Naomi was telling Ruth and uh, Orpah to go back, but then Ruth said that uh, your people, it, this is in verse 16, uh, in the last part, your people shall be my people and your God my God. Good. There's so much theme that, themes that we can really learn from this story. Yeah. Uh, for example, sort theme. Uh, I can see when 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 Boaz bought uh, Ruth. Some kind. Uh, I cannot. Uh, I can only think of Christ. You know. Yeah. Brought us <laughs> with his own precious blood. So let's hold that because I want to come back to that. So I don't want to get too far off point. Um, again, so the main plot is the lineage of the Messiah. And we see that we see this other, this idea of salvation to the Gentiles and the commitment of Ruth. So again, that's coming back to the Abrahamic covenant. And we can talk about what you're saying in a second Sunday. I want to get one more. There's at least one more key component in this passage that really highlights that highlights that the the story is primarily about the the story is primarily about the um, uh, the, the the coming Messiah. What else should give this away to you? There's one other place. Danny, go ahead. Uh, for me, uh, uh, chapter four, verse thirteen. So Boaz took root and she became his wife. The bride of the groom, uh, the marriage of the, but we are the, uh, Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Let's, let's hold that thought like Sunny, Danny. That's good. We're going to discuss that in a second. I still want to come back. I'm, I'm looking at where else is this reference to the Messiah explicitly? Now, now, you, you are connected there with the salvation. I'm, I'm not minimizing that, but I just, ex, so, so that would be more application. I want explicit in the text, something that the, that, that the narrator is telling us, it's highlighting, that's really significant. Does anyone else want to take a crack at this? Yeah, sir, they miss it in Ruth 3, verse 13. Okay. Uh, if, He's saying he remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not going to redeem, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Um, so again, so that's good. That's dealing with salvation, and, and they're connected. Um, but but I, yeah. So uh, I'm looking though specifically. Um, you had a reference, so let me. I, I'm looking for an explicit reference. So for example, in Ruth, in Ruth four. 17 you have a reference to the father of david in, in 18 to 22 you have a reference to the father father david so that's an explicit reference to the messiah so there's one there's at least two other places several other places i'll just give it to you in the beginning in the days when the judges ruled there was a famine in the land of judah and a man of bethlehem bethlehem, <laughs> bethlehem of judah So the introduction, the introduction has really, we should be mindful of the how how the story introduced because we 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 can trace the the whole message of the of the story when we might be mindful of the introduction, right? <laughs> yes. Look here. So look how many times. So let me just write this down. Bethlehem of Judah. Yeah. That's that's in that's in one that's in one 
one. And then look down here. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites. If, if you looked up Ephrathite, I'll save that for the study. We're, we're going to discuss the comment. I'll save that. I'll save that for later. I'll save that for later. Um, but look at that. Look what he says. Again, from Bethlehem and Judah. So that's times two. One verse two. So that's two references, not just to Judah, but Bethlehem. Remember, in the Old Testament, Bethlehem was one of the least. It was a small, it was not significant. Yet they're highlighting that the that 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 Beth this man is from Bethlehem. Okay. Uh, when they return. When they return, so the uh, verse 19, uh, verse, sorry, not verse 19, verse, uh, verse 7, so she, uh, verse 6, then she arose, uh, she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So then they returned to the land of Judah. So verse Verse 6, it's another reference. And then in verse 19, so the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred. So there's multiple references. This is where location becomes significant. So this is going to be in verse, uh, verse 19. So again, uh, this is why the, the, the author brings up the location because he begins with Bethlehem and Judah and he ends with David. <laughs> begins with Bethlehem and Judah, ends with David. Okay. All right. Let's take a break. Okay. So I hope that what we saw from all this, the climax is when uh, somewhere between the time that, that Boaz, uh, uh, the other redeemer cannot, Boaz claims Ruth until the birth of the child. Okay, that's somewhere with the climax, number one. Number two, the main plot is not primarily about Ruth and Boaz, although they are fundamental to the story. It's primarily about the lineage of the Messiah. Okay, um, and so there's a lot of truth we're going to discuss. In the next hour, we'll discuss there is application for us, for sure. It's, it, but, but we need to think about this in reference to the big story. So let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and finish this out. And um, I'll, I'll highlight some, some things of significance for us as we work through the text. So let's go ahead and take, take a 10-minute break. So, Tim, this is a really interesting story because um, I could think of how this, you know, um, I, I, Forget first the, the, the canonical way of, 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 of looking at this um, um, story. Let, let, let's go back to the Old Testament, uh, what they call this one thing, Old Testament uh, canonical uh, regarding regarding this story. So uh, I could think of, of, of how it relates really to the very beginning of the Pentateuch, especially in Deuteronomy. You know, you know, uh, you know, buying if slaves or or buying buying wives <laughs> wives in the book of Deuteronomy. This is some kind of of a you know a law that is being narrated, or or perhaps the law is being applied here in the story. Uh, yeah, and and it's really interesting that. Uh, when we study the, the historical account such as this one, uh, sometimes people or sometimes the reader tend to forget the, the very foundation of, of the book, the very beginning of the book, which is the Pentateuch, <laughs> the Torah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. So that, that's why I, I actually learned this from, from D.E. Carson when, you, when we, uh, when we uh, study biblical theology or something like that. I, I just read uh, the article from, from him. Uh, from 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 study Bible called biblical theology, you know, the, the NIV biblical theology, the NIV study Bible biblical theology. 
Yeah, uh, that's good. Yeah. It's really good uh, resource if you are able to, to buy this book. Uh, plus mates, <laughs> please own one. <laughs> and yeah, I read part of the article of that book. Uh, this was scanned by my, my, my friend. And uh, so, sometimes when we, when we read, all, he, he suggests that when we read a book from within the Bible, like, we should look at it in, in the light of the law and uh, in, in the Torah, in the light of the Torah, and then, and then, and then look at how it, it also relates, not only for the five books of Moses, but also the culmination of, of the promise of, of the law, which of the fulfillment of the law, which is the New Testament. And that's how, that's how the biblical study works, according to <laughs> Carson. I'm just summarizing his, or paraphrasing his statement there. So yeah, it's really it's really good. Um, looking at in a in a perspective of a Jewish law and also in you know in the fulfillment of Christ, yeah. we could we could eventually understand what what this book is really all about. It's it's all about God's promise being given to Abraham and you know um, uh, partially fulfilled there in the story. And then uh, it, it leads us to, to David, you know, uh, the, the, the descendants of David, which, of course, which culminates to Jesus Christ as the culminations of... We should change the, the title from Big Story to Great Story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that, the great story of the Bible. I like yeah, that. The, that yeah. <laughs> when we, the next time we teach the class, I'll change it to the great story of the Bible. That's good. I, I like that boy. We're going to change it. I, I, we won't change it this time because of all the stuff we've already done. But next class, the great story of the Bible. That's good. That's really good. Team. Team. Uh, uh, I'm reading Ruth chapter 2, verse 4. Okay. It seems the okay. connection of Bethlehem, a man. The, 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 the chapter 1, Bethlehem, which points to the family of Elimelech and his two sons, yeah. they have no children. So I could not see any continuity from the life of Elimelech. But I can see the life of Boaz. It's Ruth chapter 2, verse 4. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. And notice in 2 verse 1, a worthy man who's uh, of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And I, I, I do think, Henry, like what you're saying, Elimelech really, he shirked his duty. He left the land. He really... Uh-huh. And... and, and Boaz is the one, though. Boaz is the one. Boaz is the connection. He's the redeemer. He's the faithful one. Yeah. So this could be also a, a type of Christ, right? <laughs> Boaz. Yes. Boaz. Yes. No, it's supposed. You, you're. Boaz is the redeemer, mm-hmm. and he is a type pointing to Christ. We're going to talk about that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's a really great story. I mean. <laughs> Okay. What is interesting to me is the use of the word redeem when it with pertaining to the land. If you want to get back the land, you use the word redeem the land and then connect it to the redemption uh, in the bigger context. Yeah. yeah. Well, so here's the thing. Think about this too. In, in redemption, you're bu- we're, being bought, we're being bought back from sin and death. We're being redeemed. It's that same type of language. Yeah. There, there is that buying so, back. Yes. That's why I, I understand it better because uh, the word redeem is more of a legal term than an ordinary word for yeah. us to understand. It's the, the understanding is a legal term. It's a legal term. Yeah, yeah true, true, true. Yeah. There's so much legal terminology. That's why, you know, people who deny the, the, the courtroom setting of salvation, they don't want to talk about... Uh, this 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 courtroom context because they don't they don't like they don't they're against a, a conservative view of salvation. 
justification, substitutionary yeah, yeah. atonement, and, and you can't, like what you're saying, it's all over the place. You, you cannot, and actually the amazing thing, Boboy, right, is that our physical story is analogous to the eternal reality. Yeah. It's not the other way around. That's why. That's why. Um, um, I would. I. I am compelled. What. What Carson says that uh, we should also read the Book of Ruth in the light of the Torah, the law. <laughs> it is. No, you have to. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to. And actually, yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do one more for you. You have oh, to read yeah, it nice. in the context of Israel. So, uh, mm -hmm. is everyone back, or is, or is it, or are we missing some people? Is everyone back? Can we begin? I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah, one. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Great. Okay. I can't all right, so we'll, let's go ahead and begin and let's get into the text and let's, so what I want to do is I want to highlight some things. Um, let's go ahead and get in the text. And I, I just want to talk through some things for us and then I have a, maybe a handout I'll, I'll, I'll give to you. So, okay, so we have, we have the text here. I just want to highlight some things. And so what I want us to be considering is that right now we are focused upon, right now we're focused upon, um, us. Right now, we're looking at a structure analysis, right? So what I want us to be thinking about, what I want us to be thinking about is number one, um, uh, breaking out story to preach, teach, right? So we can't we can't preach and teach this entire book in one setting. We're gonna to have to break it out, okay? So once you have that big, once you see the big picture, if I was preaching the book of Ruth, if I was teaching the book of Ruth in a small group, you have to do this preparation now. You would have to do the whole plot trace. Once you get that big picture, then we can break it out into smaller chunks to preach or to teach, okay? So that's the first thing I want us to think about. The second thing is that although this, we're only focusing on structure analysis. You still need to consider a background study. You need to consider a, also you need to consider um, uh, um, uh, Christ and the gospel, which is what we're doing right now, okay? But the background study is going to help us with with um with more significance so let's just look through here so coming in here right here you have this here is the right here this is the setting right we identified that so then over here what we highlighted here is that this is telling us about Messiah, right? Messiah. Correct? It's talking about Messiah. Now look at this though. Notice something we have that's very interesting here. We have this reference to this famine, and we also have this reference to the judges that ruled. So what I want to say here is that let's study this. And also that, what is so significant about this and this? Ruth was written. Oh, go ahead, Sonny, during, go ahead. Ruth was written during this time of Judges. Yes, exactly. So uh, let's also look at the names here. We identified this before, and then also here. So this is really, this is. These, this right here is going to be very important for the background, okay? So let's go now to look at judges. Look at the context of judges. And this really sets us up. If, if you're an Israelite, you already know what's going on, okay? But we're, we're not Israelites, and we don't read, 
what Sonny said. We need to read more and more. Let's go to Judges because it's in the days of the Judges, right? So this is sometime during the days of the Judges. We don't know when, but let's just look at the Judges. Let's, let's go to the beginning of Judges. Let's, let's to set up the context for, and let's go to the end, okay? Okay, let's look down here. So they're called, uh, the beginning of Judges, they're called to, to go up. Right? They're, they're called to go up against the Canaanites, okay? Look at what happens. Look at how the beginning of Judges begins. Manasseh did not drive out. Ephraim did not drive out. Zebulun did not drive out. So we have this failure. We have right here uh, disobedience. Many times, okay? This keeps going on, really emphasizing the sin of, of, of Israel, Israel's disobedience. Look at what chapter 2 says. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you out of Egypt and brought you to the land. I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the hand. Uh, um, uh, with, with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. Look at this. But you have not obeyed my voice. Joshua dismisses the people. And then watch this. Let's go down here. Look at how Israel's unfaithfulness. Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Oops. This is the context of the days of Judges, okay? So this is setting us up. This is setting us up for, for what is to come, right? They, they, they served Baals. They abandoned the Lord. They went after other gods. They provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord. I mean, this is multiple, many, many references of uh, of failure. The, the Lord raises up judges, but they would not listen to the judges. They hoard after other gods. Whenever a judge died, they turned back and they were more corrupt. So this is the context of the judges in which Ruth is written. That's powerful, right? Look at how this concludes. Let's, let's look at how Judges concludes. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's the summary of Judges. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Ruth. <laughs> And when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. <laughs> so, let's ask the question, why do you think there was a famine in the land? It is God's punishment. Yes. Because of disobedience, yeah. What does Elimelech's name mean? King. God is my king. Malik. Malik king. God is king. <laughs> God is my king. And look what happens. <laughs> Same. Hold up. Go ahead. I think one good reason why there was punish or there was famine there is probably since they were the Israelites got integrated with the, that that uh, what which, which tribe was that? Canaanites. The Canaanites. God wanted to prove that He was above the gods of the Canaanites. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What what we can say for sure though is that when there is a famine, it is because of the judgment of God. 
That's that famine is associated. If you go back, so reading this in an Israelite context, right? God brings blessing when they're faithful, when they're disobedient, when they're not faithful, God brings judgment. Okay, everyone sees that. So reading in the days of judge when the judges ruled there was a famine in the land, you, you can't begin to understand the context unless you understand what's going on during the judges. Mm. But it's intriguing to know that as far as other tribes are concerned, like the Phoenicians, they call Baal Shaman as Lord of Heaven. So it's almost similar to attributed to God. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that, th 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 there's actually a competition between Baal yeah. and Papa. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Which makes sense, right? It makes sense because Satan is always a counterfeit. Satan is always a counterfeit trying to, to take the place of God. So it would make sense that he would create a God named Baal. <laughs> That's, that also means Lord. Baal also means Lord. Yeah. So I want to emphasize here that this act, this act is a faithless act. I want us to see that. Okay. So um, coming back now here. The background study, um, studying, studying judges, number one, looking at the, the law, the Pentateuch, investigating names. is fundamental to this story here. Now, if you look up this word Ephrathite, that's an old name for, for, for someone from Bethlehem. <laughs> that's how they would be called. You know, if you, I don't, I, maybe Warai, Warai would be Basayan, right? It's, it's, the, it's the same. If you call someone a Warai, Warai, or someone is from Basaya, it's the same, Diba, it's the same. And that's the case with an Ephrathite. So an Ephrathite is from Bethlehem in Judah. That's another, it's an older name. Okay. So really the accents on, let's come back here. So we, we have to look at the context of the judges, the law, investigating the names. And then number four, um, Abraham. Abraham's covenant and Messiah. Everyone tracking with me? So this background study is absolutely important. So anyone who's teaching on Ruth that does not do this, they're going to be at a, a severe disadvantage. I, I, would, I would argue that they're going to miss the main point. Okay, good. So let's move on here, okay? Um, so the next thing I want us to consider is Christ in the gospel. So I want us to be thinking about where can we include Christ in the gospel as we preach through here? So for sure, we can include our discussion here. Um, also here, what does it mean, right? We can use that and discuss that. Coming down here, I also want us to see this here is a beautiful picture of a Gentile conversion. Gentile conversion, okay? And so we could include the gospel and salvation here. We can talk about this is living by faith. Mm. 
Remember, this is the inward, the inward, the outward is the action. The inward is, it has to be, has to be present. Okay, is everyone tracking with me there? Yes, yes. Good. Now, what I would do is I would, if I was preaching this, I would end, it, now maybe you couldn't do this, but I would, I would end the, I would preach or teach chapter one. I would preach or teach chapter one. Okay. Let me prepare a, let me show you a quick handout that I prepared here. Um, so in the background study, we should talk about uh, God is faith, the purpose of the book. God is faithful to his promises, even when his people are not. And, and so specifically, it's the Messiah, okay? The promise of the, Messiah, the Messianic seed that will save us from our sins, okay? So then there's, there's various themes here that we can discuss. I'll come back to this in a second, but coming down here, looking at an outline, okay? I want to I wanna zoom in on this outline here, okay? If I was, this is an exegetical outline, okay? So this is an exegetical outline for Ruth 1 to 1, Ruth 1, 1 to 22, okay? So I, I am not, you cannot have 20, in 22 verses, you can't have 22 points. It's just too big. Does everyone understand that? Just too big. So I pretty much have, I have the outline set up into two parts. Number one, the, the setting or, and the characters, introducing the setting and the characters, and then dealing with the big points. The, so I'm looking more at like, what are the big events in chapter one? Is everyone tracking with how I'm, I'm looking at a broader exegetical outline? I, it's just too many. If you're just going every single point, you'll have a million points, okay? So by way of, by way of the setting and the characters, number one, Israel's wickedness and faithlessness during the time of the judges. So I'm literally taking that one phrase and I'm going to expand upon it to set up the context for my listeners. Okay, so I would do, what, do what, what, I, what I did as far as highlighting the sin, the faithlessness, the, the wickedness in the judges. The next thing I would do is I would highlight the line of the Messiah. Look at the, the, look at the, look at the Messiah, the line of the Messiah. If you want to also include in here talking about the, the, the law and the story of Israel, you can also discuss that as well, because that's part of, that's, you're setting up the story for your listeners, okay? And then I would also talk about the names and the characters and the significances and the meanings. So that would be my first major point, okay? And you have to create, you have to move to the theological and then also the practical, but I'm just setting up the, the exegetical outline right now, okay? Then I would deal with the act one, act one. Now, maybe you want to say there's two acts. There's a, there's, there's a Bimelech's act of faithlessness. Um, and then maybe you want to deal with, you want to have a, um, you want to break this down more. Fair enough. We can add more. But I'm just doing the big points. Maybe you want to include um, Ruth, Ruth's act, and maybe Naomi's repentance. If you want to do two parts, you can. Is everyone tracking with me? You could do like a... Act one, Elimelech. And so here, oops, sorry. Um, So then here you could do uh, um, Naomi's repentance <laughs> and Ruth's conversion, <laughs> right? And then we can, oops. So is everyone tracking with what I just did there? So Elimelech is faithless. He abandons the Lord. 
and these are this is these are the acts surrounding his action okay and then you can talk about Naomi's repentance and Ruth's conversion so Naomi hears that the Lord has has visited her people she returns Ruth converts and follows the living God Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem during harvest time okay there's different ways you can do it but, but you know there's there's different ways you can do it this is how I would do it okay let me just take a pause. I don't want to go too fast. Any questions or comments on how I came up with this? Uh, think this is think this is the advantage when you do plot trace. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Heavy emphasis at the beginning, big reward at the end. And if you do the plot trace for the book, listen, listen. A lot of work up front, Viva, but you could preach. You could even break this down into two sermons. You could preach, you could preach eight weeks. You could preach, you could preach eight weeks, four weeks, five weeks. So this is again why expository preaching with the, the plot trace tool will reap dividends. You can only do it one time, and then you have you have really a, a big yeah, excellent observation, Henry. Excellent. I also want to highlight something here, just in a quick way. The other thing here is this, the, the fact that Elimelech dies in a foreign land and his sons also die, this is, now, let me be clear. What we've learned from Job, what we've learned in the New Testament is that not all death is because of sin. So I don't want you to immediately think, oh, sin, death, and start preaching. Like, I don't want. I don't want us to see that. But what I want us to see is that in Israel's day, blessing was connected with obedience, cursing with death. It's very clear. This is why Sonny was excellent in emphasizing the the Mosaic Law and going back to the Pentateuch. Okay. So, so someone who did not have a long life, especially in the Old Testament, that was attributed to disobedience. So that's why we can clearly see here, we, it, would, it would be dangerous for us to bring out an eternal truth, although it is true, if someone is living a life of habitual sin, that will lead to death. Even Paul says in Corinthians 5, uh, uh, 5 6, and also is it 9, uh, 11, that some people are sickly and even dead among you because of, because of sin. So so there is, there is a truth that habitual sin leads to death, okay? Temporal death, not necessarily eternal death, okay? It depends. James 1, the, 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 the temptation gives birth to sin, and sin when it's brought to completion is death, okay? So we can, we, we can draw a theological truth that our disobedience leads to death, we need to be careful, though, in applying it to different people's situations. Okay? That's where we have to be delicado telegat. Is everyone tracking with me? Everyone tracking with me? It doesn't mean we automatically start to say everyone who's dying or sick is sinning. Okay? We don't do that. But we do draw a th – so this would be one theological truth. One theological truth would be that disobedience, leaving the promises of God – was this not an opportunity for Elimelech to trust in God's provision? Just like in the wilderness, Bible's big story, right? They were in the wilderness, and they, they had a chance to trust, right? And they were, they were always complaining and grumbling, okay? So let's just take a break. Is, uh, everyone sees, though, how, how I develop this exegetical outline. Everyone sees that? Yes, yes. It made me. It made me think. It made me think that um, you know, the the things that uh, people are mis uh, you know, some misunderstood the Old Testament, and they would uh, say that uh, well, Old Testament is a more on legalistic type of of documents or theology. But uh, I think that's that's a misreading of of of, of the Old Testament, really. As we read the book, uh, the book of Ruth, just the book of Ruth, we see this: the, the the grace of God is being manifested there, 
And um, when, when I say legalistic, uh, I define legalistic as uh, we, we, we earn our salvations by, by works. And that's why there, there is a there is a some kind of controversial in our uh, churches today that um you know s still teach the salvation salvation by works <laughs> yeah. and uh, they would they would use the new the, the the old testament as a as a reference to it. The, the things that you've discussed they would use that as a reference and uh, my take on that is that uh, uh yeah, I, I would say it's, it's a misreading of the whole council of the Old Testament, especially the whole council of the Bible, because the law was given after God redeemed the Israelites, right? <laughs> God showed mercy to Abraham, showed mercy to the descendants of, and, and showed mercy to Israelites. They drew it first from, from, Israel, from, from out of Egypt before they were given the, the, the Ten Commandments, the law. So the law really precedes the salvation. Salvation first before all those things. Yeah. So retribution type. This is also the, the problems of what we call the retribution theology. That all sins are led to death because of, of that. So. Yeah, no, that, that's good. Now there is there is a there is truth in the retribution uh, theology, but it's not ultimate. Yeah, it's not ultimate. Yeah, so there is that that is true. So even 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 Paul says, but you sow, you'll reap. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to life, you'll, you'll reap life everlasting. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. but it's true, but it's not ultimate. And, we, and, and we're not the one to judge, to assess if mm. someone is dying or sick, if they are mm. experiencing the retribution. Because we talked about before, you can be suffering a trial. God's the trials, God gives trials to perfect our faith. Uh, you know, we can be suffering because of spiritual warfare. We can be suffering. Yeah, so there's various reasons. So we, we treat, we, we teach the truths, right, the, 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 the retribution, uh, um, uh, but we don't judge. That's yeah, the key. Yeah. That's the key. And, and that, that, that's great. That's a great uh, comment as far as legalism, right? Um, excellent, excellent uh, comments, um, Sonny. Excellent, excellent job. Um, Good. Anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to add to this? If I was preaching this, I would include the gospel here. I would include the gospel here. And this would be explicit. So I would, I would. I think it's a perfect place to put the gospel, to put the need for everyone, you know, to, to turn and to commit to Christ. That, that's where I would, that's where I would, ha I would have a discussion, discussion point here. The other thing, too, is that, again, the law is so foundational because here, you buy the law, the law forbade intermarriage. Now, now. The law forbade intermarriage, yet Ruth was God's sovereign plan. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Ruth was part of God's sovereign plan, and yet they should not have married. They should not have married. This comes back to the Pentateuch, what Sonny's saying. Uh, the brothers of Joseph meant it for evil, planned it, literally planned it for evil. God planned it for good. So Malion and Kilion, they sinned against God. They, they intermarried. They meant it for bad. They were faithless. Elimelech leaving the land, they were faithless. They, they, they rejected the, the sovereign. Uh, they, they rejected the commandment of God, yet God planned it for good. <laughs> Both are true. It's hard. This is hard, but this is this is the sovereignty of God. He is working all things. Ephesians one. He's working all things according to the counsel of His will. God is not the author of sin, yet He uses all things to bring about His purpose. And so you'll say, Tim, this is hard. But you know, I'm struggling here thinking about this. Think about this. 
the greatest crime in the history of the world was the crucifying of an innocent man, yet God used it to save the world. The crucifixion was a terrible sin, yet that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God is not the author. He's the one that ordains. He allows it. He permits it. So in one sense, he ordained it. We have to say that. But he's not the author in that he is the one actually carrying out the sin. He is not the one that, that has any liability. He, 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 he ordains it, and thus he allows it to occur. And, uh, and, um, and we have to accept it. So here we see that. There is no excuse for Elimelech to leave the, the land. He should not have left. Yet God used it to bring Ruth into his people. And Ruth, she is, she is, she is a grand, 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 grandmother of the Messiah. And we also see here, right, that the Gentiles are part of the plan. The Gentiles are part of the plan. So there's so many trajectories we can go here for uh, preaching this. Um, let's see what else we have down here. Um, Tim, uh, what you're saying is uh, the concept of sovereignty. Yes. When you are sovereign, you cannot do wrong, even if the wrongs are happening. Yeah. You, are not, you are not responsible for the wrong, although it happens and it's usually happening. Same principle applies to the state. No, the state has sovereign sovereignty of the state. You cannot uh, uh, charge the state as responsible for what's happening because of its sovereignty, but you have to look somewhere else for all the damage or all the uh, things that are happening in, in a particular place or in a country, but not the state. That's why there is such a principle of sovereignty. That's the same sovereignty attributed to God. Yeah. You cannot blame God because he is sovereign. That's yeah. the same principle. Those who understand sovereignty of nations, that's how it should apply. That's the application of God's sovereignty. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, actually it's very difficult. Actually it's very difficult to understand it. But uh, if you understand what sovereignty encompasses, you would understand why there is such a thing as sovereignty of God. And, and that's analogous to God's sovereignty, the, the sovereignty of the nations. We, we always go back to our physical is analogous. Yeah, it's analogous. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reflection. It's a reflection, yeah. A very incomplete, it's a very incomplete reflection, but it is a reflection nonetheless. Excellent. So we see here, though, we see the hand of God in all of the, this whole, even though God is not mentioned, he is present working all things to bring about his promises. So we need to be discussing the promises of Abraham, even the promise to the, to the, the Bob, because we looked at the promise of Abraham. It's the seed that will bless all the nations. And that, that is the fulfillment from the promise, the proto-evangelium to, to even Eve. So we need to consider these as we preach through the gospel, uh, as we preach through the story of Ruth. Okay. Everyone tracking with me there? Every, every, everything's good there? It makes sense? Um, so uh, the other thing I want to add, so what I have here now is I just have um, some places, there's many more places where I will include the gospel, where I include the mention of Christ. So the first one here is we talked about this, is, is that Jesus is going to fulfill these events here. This is... Uh, these events precede the coming of Jesus. So there's fulfillment here, okay? Jesus is also uh, present in Ruth's commitment to the Lord, okay? Ultimately, she's trusting in the Lord and the promises which include the Messiah and his work, okay? Boaz is a man of faith. This goes to what, what, what Henry was saying. Um, Boaz is a man of faith. Um, uh, we don't have time to go here, but in the law... They were commanded to care for and to treat sojourners well. He treats sojourners very good. It reveals the heart condition, his heart of loving, of generosity to those outside. Um, and so there's, uh, there's also this type. We can also talk about um, Boaz as a type of Christ. 
pointing to the Christ, the one who will redeem, right? So I hope that we're seeing that in the context we see, so this is not allegory. This is not allegorical interpretation. Although maybe some would say, oh, it's allegory. But, but I hope that you're really seeing in the context, it's built, ingrained in the structures. It's ingrained in the, the constructs. And it's clearly pointing towards something beyond the story, okay? Um, Ruth is accepted and becomes a great woman in Israel, right? So she is a woman of faith. She is a woman of faith. Look at Naomi's blessing and prayer to the Lord, right? And so this really comes back, if you were to ask who the main character is, the main character is really Naomi. Naomi is uh, um, Elimelech, dies, he's faithless, Naomi is struggling, and she, she's struggling with her faith, and she, if she's in a place of doubt, of sadness and then the conclusion is this blessing and prayer to the lord the women said to naomi blessed be the lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in israel he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him so this is this is uh, blessing to the Lord. This is blessing to the Lord. To Boaz, right? As the Redeemer. And also Ruth. So there's so much here we can talk about, okay? And then, of course, we have the genealogy. Um, so these are ways that we consider or... And in some way, we're going to look at the relationship with Christ. So, so how you do that is up to you, okay? There's not a black, black, black or white uh, answer here, okay? Um, the other, coming back up here, I just want to, I want to highlight several things here. Um, several themes. The, the Lord is bringing seed forth, so he's bringing forth offspring, um, to further his purposes and confirm his promises in miraculous beyond belief events. Okay, so this is, this is an amazing birth event. You have two sons that are dead, and yet God still saves the, the, the offspring of, of Abraham, really, that's going to be fulfilled in, in the Messiah. Uh, God's salvation... Um, and part of his sovereign plan includes Gentiles, not just Jews. Um, Pastor Tim, I have a comment. Yeah. I, I read from the commentary regarding Boaz, uh, as he is also from the lineage of Rahab. Is it? Yes, yes, yes. Now that's really good. And you actually see that in, in Matthew's genealogy. They pick up on Rahab, on um, Bathsheba on Ruth, and I think Tamar, is Tamar the fourth? I think there's four women, four Gentile women. Uh, yes, Tamar uh, is part of it. Yeah, there's four, there's four Gentile women that are included in the, yeah, and, in the yeah. genealogy of the Messiah. And because salvation is to the Jew first and also the Greek. <laughs> Also the American, also the Filipino, also the Chinese, the African. It's for all people. Um, and then also here. So th this is not to say that we only look at promise and fulfillment in Christ. We don't look to ourselves. We still want to look at faith and trust in the promises of God, even in the darkest of times. We are to trust and to commit to God, come what may. Um, and so there is truth for us that Ruth was faithful, Boaz was faithful, despite bad circumstances. Naomi returned, even though she was outside, she returned. And so there's application for us. But this is the difference between a man-centered and God-centered interpretation. God-centered first looks at the story and to see what God is doing, right? Before just... Deba all of us, before we would just, how does this apply to me? 
I need to have application for me. And we're like, no, no, no. Let's set that aside. Let's focus to see what God is doing to bring about his promises. Let's look to see how this is fulfilling God's great story. And then from there, we, we look at the application for us. So typically we have the book, right? And immediately, immediately we apply it to ourselves. That's what typically happens. So what I'm, what I'm asking us to do is to, is to refrain from this. And, and, and this is a, a man-centered interpretation. Man-centered. Rather, I'm asking us to go to, to God-centered And th so, so this is our focus, and then we look, we, do you see that? Do you see that? Do you see what I'm saying? We need to, we need to, we need to, um, if we're looking at time, it's, it's longer to get to our application. It's longer to get to our, to our application, but it's necessary. Okay, does everyone, let me, let me zoom this in here. Can everyone see that now? So your tendency is when you read a story is to immediately say, what are some truths that can apply to me, to, to my situation? And I want to say that is instant gratification. Try to hold, try to put a hold on that and say, how does this, what is God doing? What is God and what is Christ doing? And then later we can apply it to ourselves. Okay. All right, um, we are done narrative, narrative structure analysis. I hope that maybe you'll study, maybe you'll teach Ruth. Uh, maybe we can also do this later in, for Esther or for Jonah. Jonah is really good. <laughs> Jonah is so good. Oh my goodness. Or some of the other stories. Um, you know, EVST, it's the limit. We can do book studies like this. We can, that can be part of our curriculum. So let's think about that. Um, but next week we will do poetry. So we'll do a, a poetry analysis. So we're going to move from narrative. You have the tools. You have the tools for epistles. You have the tools for all the stories. This is, I think, one third of the Bible. You have the tools. So when, when you're in the Pentateuch, when you're in the historical books, I hope that you'll be using this type of method. I really do. I hope, you, I hope you'll be using this type of method. I'm going to start posting some of these other things on, on, on a cloud that you can have access to. It's going to take some time, but I hope that you saw the vision. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this good time. Even though we had some technical difficulties, I thank you for keeping everything running. Father, I hope and, I, I hope and pray that, that we would have seen the, the, big, the big picture here that um, that you are sovereign and that, that even though things look bad and, and we are faithless, and, and, um, that you are faithful to your promises and that you are faithful to bring in your son to save us of our sins. Help us to, to use this new tool, this narrative analysis in, in so many stories in the scripture, even applying it outside as we um, use it in other applications. Father God, may we, we use this for your glory and for your honor and may they uh, I just pray for the, the success of the students, that they would grow it in their interpretative um, uh, practices and that they would really apply these tools uh, to your word. 
and that you would transform our lives through the power of your words. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Good night.